mic's going here. All right. There is children's church for children uh, about three up to kindergarten, and they can just go down the stairs and pick up someone there to meet you and give you a little time going on this morning. Wednesday night, we are going to start something called, again, called WOW. Wow. It is WOW. It's worship on Wednesday, all right? And it'll start at 6.30, go to about 7.30, okay? And we'll have a little worship and some teaching and a good way to come in the middle of the week if you refresh the God's presence. So, starting this Wednesday, wow. Hopefully it's well for you. Let's all stand and read God's word from John chapter 14. We have entitled these important words for Jesus, Truth for Troubled Times. Truth for Troubled Times. Things that Jesus has given to us to anchor our souls, to anchor our lives. When life is come, we know those times come. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place. Or would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you are going. How can, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? <clears throat> Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his words. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else, believe on the count of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than I, or greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Thank you, may receive it. <coughs> One of the most important scripture passages of all is John 14, 16. John 14, verse 6. Now, if I were to give you a little assignment this morning, say, if I told you, I want you to go to Sioux Falls for me. Okay? What do you go to Sioux Falls? And the only way you can get there, there's only one way to Sioux Falls, right? You gotta go US 50 to I-29. How many of you would follow my direction? How many of you are just a little bit, uh, would struggle with the directions and say, wait a second, I think I can find another way. Because if you look at the map, there's about a hundred ways to Sioux Falls. If you take all the back roads, like, I like them. You know, I take many of them and find all kinds of adventures out there um, along the way. Uh, we are just independent enough and autonomous, right, in our spirits to say with a little bit of resistance that the notion that there's only one way to accomplish something is something we're going to challenge in life, right? If somebody said, this is the only way you can do something, we might start to think, well, um, I'd like to test that, right? I'm going to see if that's really true. We struggle hearing one road, one path, one way, one acceptable way of getting to a desired goal, even when that desired goal potentially is what's called everlasting life. In our world today, if you state there is only one way to God, you will find some very clear resistance to that, right? You're, you're not going to find people who are going to go, oh yeah, I just agree with that. Right? You're going to find people who will resist that. In fact, you will encounter more people than you might think in our society in America who will 
that if you assert this to them with confidence, they will say, wait a second. There, there are many ways. There's, there's many way roads to life. Many paths to eternal bliss with God. And people will tell you, it really doesn't matter what path you take, uh, just as long as you take one of the many options that are being presented and are available for a person to take to get their way back to God. Now, I've been in conversations where people are, are talking about their, their children, right? Their children are not with them now. And they said, you know, my children are just going to church A. You know, and it's, it's not really, I'm not really excited that they're going to church, but I'm just glad they're going to church, right? Because obviously the parent thinks church is a good thing. Unless that church isn't telling your child the truth, right? And and is there is there a sense that there is one body of truth, one communication of a gospel, one method of salvation, one way to heaven? And that if your child is going to a church that says, you know, the Lutherans have a way, and the Catholics have a way, and the Baptists have a way, and the Presbyterians have a way, and the Muslims have a way, and uh, the Buddhists have a way, and the Hindus have a way, and, you know, they're all equally valid, just as long as they seek a way, they're going to find their way, right? And that's kind of the spirit of the age in which we live, and it's called religious pluralism. Many ways. Don't offend anyone with one way. Don't be that brash. Don't be that arrogant. Don't be that smug to say there's only one way. Don't step on people's faith journey or spiritual journey or whatever they're on by saying there's only one way. And if you're not taking that way, you're eternally lost. And we face that in our world today. where people are asserting many ways, many paths. You choose the path that works well for you, that fits the way you want to sort of live life. Now, for those who, it's, uh, who aspire to this thinking, to this, this notion that there's one exclusive path to God, revealed in the pages of Scripture, people like that in the world today are seen as dangerous. So if you believe that, you're seen as dangerous. You're seen as narrow-minded, right? You're, you're, you're politically incorrect if you say there's one way to heaven. And most of all, if you say there's one way to heaven, you're arrogant, right? There's probably a lot of labels that could be attached. So I'm going to play a little clip this morning of how you answer a question when someone says you seem to be quite arrogant to assert that there's one way to heaven. Here's how you might answer it. I think this is quite a popular view and one that's particularly popular in sort of multi-faith or multicultural societies. There's a story uh, which is quite old which I find quite helpful just to think through some of the issues. Uh, it's about some blind men and an elephant uh, and each of the blind men encounters this elephant at different points and then has a different idea about what the elephant's like. So the man who's holding the trunk says that the elephant's like a snake. And the guy who's holding the leg says, no, it's not like a snake. Elephants are like trees. And the guy who's holding the tusk says, well, actually, you're both wrong, because the elephant's really like a spear. And so on and so forth. Everyone holding a different part, whether it's the ear or the side or the tail. Everyone's coming up with a different view. And the idea is that this story shows us that no one can actually know the whole truth about God. When it comes to the questions about the truth, we're just like blind men touching an elephant. Now anyone who therefore says, I know the truth about God and you don't, I've got the, the right answer and you've got the wrong answer, well, we just call them arrogant. But imagine if someone said he wasn't describing the elephant, he wasn't touching the elephant, but actually he was the elephant. Imagine if someone said, you don't need to guess, you don't need to grope around, I'll tell you what it's like, because I'm the elephant. Well, that's what the Bible says about Jesus. Not that Jesus was an elephant, uh, I don't think anyone actually believes that, but that Jesus was God, that Jesus is God. 
And Jesus did some amazing things to back up that claim. He healed the sick. He controlled the weather. He raised the dead. Jesus wasn't just a teacher or a philosopher or a religious guy trying to guess about God. The Bible says that Jesus was God. So Jesus was able to explain the truth about God. He was able to explain how to be in a relationship with God. He was able to explain how to enjoy perfect life with God forever. When he said, I am the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. If he's God, he's not being arrogant. He's telling the truth. Now if those blind men having heard the elephant had come out and arguing, um, they'd be pretty arrogant too. And anyone who said that we can't know the whole truth would also be pretty arrogant. You see, the right thing to do in that situation would be to sit down and listen to the elephant. That's the way you're going to get the truth. I suppose when it comes to God, the way we're going to find the truth is if we listen to him. And Jesus says you do that by listening to him. about Jesus quite offensive, quite narrow, quite radical, and quite dangerous. For as we see in today's scripture passage, Jesus wasn't a pluralist. He wasn't in agreement with those who believed that there were other roads to heaven and proclaiming those in his day. Jesus wouldn't have validated another person's belief or system or way to God so as not to offend that person. To allow them to continue on believing that. And the reason he wouldn't be open to diversity on the way to God is because of the very important statement that he makes as he clarifies for his, one of his own disciples in their own confusion. Because Jesus says, I'm going away. And where, you, where I'm going, you can't go. But he says, you guys know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, you know, the doubter, the guy that doesn't have Jesus quite figured out, says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, hey, Thomas, wait a second. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So what is Jesus asserting in this statement? He's making a bold assertion that there's only one way to God. And who better to know that than God himself? As you go on in the text, Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. If I'm speaking, it's as if God is speaking because I am God. And so if I'm saying I am the way, the truth, and the life, then it's God speaking to you, God telling you, this is how you get to heaven. This is how you conquer and get out of this world of sin and death and darkness. This is the road. This is the path. God is telling it to you. And so, you can't get to the Father, the God of creation, any other way. All other paths that people might assert to you are false. They're man-made. They are crafted by men in rebellion, really in resistance to the means that God himself has established. And obviously this path has been resisted and rebelled against throughout all eternity, and we can see it. There, there's a war against Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. That's going on in culture and society. No one comes, wants to come, and there are struggles to want to acknowledge it. And you see that struggle happens very, very soon in Genesis chapter 3, uh, when uh, Cain and Abel come onto the scene. Uh, Jude talks about, behold, they've gone the way of Cain. What is he talking about? He's talking about people who devise their own way to God. Because that's exactly what Cain did. God said, Cain, I want you to bring this sacrifice, just like your brother Abel. I want you to, to bring the lamb and, and sacrifice that to me. This is your offering 
to, to make atonement for your sin. This is the way I want you to come to me, to approach me. God sets the path, the mediation on, on how people can approach him. And Cain says, uh, no, God, I, I want to do something of myself. I want to devise a way of my own. I want to bring the works of my hands and offer those to you because I'm very proud of what I've done. I'm pretty proud of the farming and the agriculture and the fruit and the vegetables that, that I've worked very, very diligently to, to grow and to produce. And, and so I want to bring these as my offering and sacrifice because I believe that, that these are very much a reflection of who I am. And God says, wait a second, Cain, they're not acceptable. That's not what I want. That's not the way I've chosen. And on from Cain and throughout the generations, People have gone the way of Cain, trying to provide a works righteousness, ways that I can do my good deeds and somehow work my way into the presence of God, hoping somehow that will catch God's attention. It will be enough that when I die, um, I've done enough to work my way to the path of eternal bliss in salvation in heaven forever. And Jesus is putting it into that notion, just like God put it into that notion to Cain's uh, or futile efforts when he said sin is crouching at your door. He's, he's saying, Cain, just come the right way. Just come by faith. It's bringing the sacrifice. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, guys, here's the way. Come by faith. Come by me. Come by believing that I am the Savior. I am God in human flesh who's come to set you free. Jesus says all other suggestions that life can come from a variety of other sources than Jesus Christ are wrong. And that's why there's so many problems in the world today. So many people are very empty and they're working out and trying to make sense of life and trying to fill what's very empty in their life. They figure if I get this job, if I have this career, if I have this money, if I have these possessions, if I have this, that, or the other thing, if I have this degree, if I accomplish this and life, somehow that is going to satisfy me. And they find out when that doesn't satisfy me, Maybe I, can, maybe I can satisfy the empty longing with, with, with my friendships and, and, and then, you know, with, with experience and with, with, with alcohol and drugs and all kinds of things. Somehow that is going to satisfy that empty longing in my life. That's going to bring life to me. And people find out it, it just really doesn't. It only, it only puts them deeper, further in bondage uh, to, to things of this world rather than the free life that Jesus comes to give them. And so Christianity very much is persecuted, has been persecuted through the centuries for this assertion that Jesus is the only way. And I, I often wonder, why is there so much terrorism today? Why is there such a uh, insurgence of ISIS? And that thing is just kind of spiraling out of control. And none of us really know where that's going. And to see that they're, they're just little kids, that they're, they're, they're kind of you know, brainwashing to go out and do these terrorist activities to show them how to blow themselves up, telling them that you're going to get some, some supernatural thing in your heaven if you do this by being a martyr. And you can see why is terrorism growing so much? Because it is the last all-out assault to this one major statement that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You see, people don't like the fact that Jesus made that statement. They don't want to come under the authority of that statement, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way that you um, really can deal with that statement if you don't want to come under the authority is to attack it. So people have talk, attacked it through terrorism. People have talked to, to attack the statement that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life through intellectualism and through worldly ideas and through all kinds of things that seek to diminish the, the authority of Scripture, oh, you believe in that, you believe in the literal creation, you believe that, would be, oh, what a narrow-minded, simple person you are, oh, you're just so, you're just so out of it, I, I have pity on you, that's what people would say today, that they have to somehow defeat that message, they somehow have to fight against it, why, because if you accept Jesus as way, truth, and life, what happens, you have to come under the authority of Jesus Christ, you have to come under His teaching, His sovereignty, His mastership, His instruction. And people are, are struggle with that. They're a little afraid of that. Now, maybe you're here today and you struggle with that notion that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Because you're not sure you want to give your life to anyone. You want to be in control of it. 
But I always say, how's that working for us? When we're in control of our lives, sometimes things just, you know, we make a mess of things. And Jesus is just saying, I want to guide you. I want to give you my wisdom. I want to help you. I want to walk with you. I want to nourish you and encourage you and help you and strengthen you in your life. I want to help you to, to, to avoid some of the pitfalls that come when we make bad choices in life. I want to give you the wisdom to make good choices. Jesus wants to be a loving master, not one that twists our arm. He motivates us by grace. He motivates us by his love as he poured out his own life on the cross to save us from our sin. Jesus isn't a savior that just says, come and follow me. He's a savior who comes and proves he's worthy to follow as the way and truth in life because he gave his life on the cross for sin. And it's amazing how in the world would anyone believe that... Uh, could, could assert, I am the way, the truth, and the life, unless you did what Jesus did. I don't know if any of us would ever have the nerve to go in our business and, and workplace and say, you know what, people have the way, the truth, and the life. They would send you up north, wouldn't they? <laughs> we'll even help you. We'll drive you up there. You see, no one makes that assertion unless they can make that assertion, right? No one can say I'm the way, the truth, and the life unless you are the way, the truth, and the life. You'd be dumb to make that statement because people are going to hold you to it. And why would Jesus entertain other ways, right? When he gave his life on the cross for all the sins of the world. Why would he say, well, that's okay. I mean, we won't offend brothers or people over there. They, 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 they mean well, and you know, they have their way. And the, 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 I'm sorry, the people over here have their way. Oh, man, I'm getting crazy today. Because anyway, I'm excited about this message. You didn't know that. Because this is where it's all at. This is where it's all at in life. This is where the water, you know, Right? This is where the rubber is thrown. You either believe this or you don't. You either accept this, live by it, embrace it, pick it up off the floor. That's hard now. Or you don't. So Jesus is making a powerful statement. And he's going to prove it that he's the way, the truth, the life. He's just not saying it. They're going to see him die to cross. They're going to see him suffer and weep and die. So that their sins, all their shame, all their guilt, all their nasty thoughts, everything can be forgiven. You see, you don't see Buddha dying on a cross. You don't see Muhammad dying on a cross. You don't see the religions of this world having a Savior, a God, who comes and lives in human flesh and living amongst the people and living and understanding and proving that He's God by healing the sick and raising the dead and making the claims and then pouring out His life as a sacrifice and urging them, calling them by His grace and sacrifice to come, follow Him, believe that He is the way Truth. Jesus isn't out there twisting your arms to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will come and follow me, right? He, he doesn't say that. He offers his life. He offers the testimony of himself. And he says, will you believe? Will you embrace me? Will you come to me? It's powerful. And in true biblical Christianity, we find that people play no role in themselves getting to heaven. We play no role in ourselves getting to heaven. It's been offered to us as a free gift. And sometimes, you know, we're good with free gifts, right? It's amazing if you offer free food, how many people show up, right? Free, huh? I like that. I like free food. Yeah. But you offer free salvation and people go... But, um, I'd rather work for that. I'd rather give you something. I'd rather try to achieve that on my own. You offer something free as a gift of grace. 
through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for sins to receive by faith and people struggle with that. You see, Jesus is the way that truth and not life. Biblical Christianity requires people to acknowledge that we have sin. And I find in my day and age uh, that I've lived in, that is one tough thing for people to do. Especially to do that before others. I appreciate that my brother Doug was up here being vulnerable with you today. And you appreciate that too, except you don't do that. Very few people do that. That's why Christians don't grow very much in their life, because they live behind these faces of, everything's cool. Hi, right, how's it going? Who are you? I'm in church today. Yeah, it's great. How's life? Good. Glad it rained last night. Yeah. How's it really going? It's going fine. Fine. What do you mean by fine? Well, let's not get into that. I'll see you next week, right? That's kind of the way it is, isn't it? Don't get into my life, right? And we, we can admire someone when they're transparent saying, you know, life is pretty tough. Had some family issues. Had some, had some personal conflicts. Had some, had some struggles today. You see, repentance is about that. God, I screwed up. I messed up. I sinned. I offended you. People don't like to, to say they offended anyone, and yet that's what we've done. And to come to Jesus on His terms by being the way and truth, the life, we have to acknowledge that. We have to repent. And I believe there's a significant difference in what we're seeing in the world today are two different things. And one I would call religious Christianity, and the other is called biblical Christianity, right? There's two different things. Now, just like in Jewish, in Jesus' day, there was a great difference between what I would call religious Judaism, the Pharisees and those cats, right? They were doing the religious thing. They were running the rules, the regulation. It was so external. There was nothing of the heart into it. And then there was a, and there was a biblical Judaism, those who had been circumcised in their heart, who were looking by faith that God was going to provide a Savior. That these sacrifices were only a temporary thing that could be, uh, that, that pointed the way to the, the ultimate sacrifice in God, the Messiah, the Son, coming to give his life for all. And so there were those who were a very small number who were very much into what we call biblical Judaism. Now, in today's world, religious Christianity wasn't active in that. The church is very active. If the church steps into people's lives and say, We are the way to salvation. Now, they don't really say that, but they provide the path. Okay, this is what you've got to do. Simple, easy steps. You check it off, and then you do these little things, and you can be sure you're in. So the church sort of supplies the steps, the path to salvation, the way. That's religious Christianity. This is really not about Jesus. We talk about Jesus. We mention that you guys are wrong, but nothing is personal between you and Jesus. It's not a personal relationship with a God who loves you by His grace in Jesus Christ. It's not about that. It's about a, a religious experience that's conducted on Sunday and the minute or Saturday, whatever the service is, and you walk out and you put the religious ceremony behind and then you become good old whatever you want to be, right? That, that's religious Christianity. And it's in many churches. It's right here. It could be in this church. I hope it's not, but it could be. I'm not going to doubt any specific church as religious Christianity. Sometimes Baptists or, or non-denominational non people kind of get that, that audience like, well, we're of the, the right. There's a lot of religious Christianity all over the place. The church supplies the path. The object of salvation, in reality, is not Jesus Christ and Him alone. Rather, it's established by doing the works the church has passed down through the centuries. And people really are not urged to embrace a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm here today to urge you to. God did not come to this world to create a religious system. He created him this world die for sin so that we can be personal friends. So that we can have a relationship.
so that we could talk with him, so that we could share our concerns, that he could share his wisdom, so there be a dialogue that goes on between God and us, our relationship. A relationship, unlike anyone, it's a relationship of complete acceptance. It's a relationship of complete love. It's a, it's a relationship where there's great patience while we grow, while we, while we learn. It's, it's a relationship that God is faithful. He is there, right? That's what God offers to every one of us. And accepting Jesus as way, truth, and life, really to do this means there's a spiritual transformation that takes place in my life. And I'm going to ask you, have you experienced a spiritual transformation in your life? Where you were spiritually dead and now you're spiritually alive. You were dead walking in your sins, living hopelessly, but now you have embraced Christ and He's forgiven you and now you have a new life. That's what biblical Christianity is about. <coughs> Dead people coming alive through one person, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. But what do we see in the world today? In religious Christianity, we see ceremony. <coughs> we see ceremony, but we do not always see a passionate devotion to a Savior who has saved us. And I have to say, with all the religious Christianity that's reported in the world today, we can see that the world is not a better place <coughs> in the presence of religious Christianity because people's lives are not surrendered to Christ as master, as way, as truth, as life. And when they're not, it shows. When they are, you'll know. When people get serious about living with Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, it changes everything about your life. It changes what you're living for. It changes where you're going. It changes everything. It changes how, how you parent your children. It changes how you look at your job. It changes how you look at your money. It changes how you look at every aspect of your life. Because now it's not just living with, a, with an end point called the grave and death. It is living beyond that. It's living with an eternal hope and future that Jesus has offered to every one of us as way. Now, Jesus makes three statements. I'm going to go through those really quickly. He's the way, right? Jesus is not the way. What does he mean when he says, I'm the way? It means through Jesus, he is the mediator between God and men. People think they can get to God on their own means. Wrong. You can. God is holy. He's perfect. If you have sin in your life, you can't get to him. He can't accept sinners. He can't accept unholy people. So in the Old Testament, when they had the sinful Israelites, right? Moses goes to Mount Sinai, right? What's happening? God picks the mediator. Moses, Mo, you're going to mediate for your people. So what's Moses do? He goes to the people, and then he goes to God. And God speaks to Moses. Moses goes back to the people. He talks to them. And we have this. And who's in the middle? Who's the middle guy? Who's the mediator? Moses. Who chose the mediator between God and Israel? Did Moses? No. Moses saw the burning bush and he's going, God, you've got somebody if somebody else can do this job. Right? I don't want to. So as the way, Christ is the way. He's the mediator to the fathers whose house who has many rooms. You know that place that's prepared for us in heaven? To be received and taken up to heaven when we die can only be granted by Jesus because to get to God, there has to be a mediator. And God has to choose the mediator and God has chosen His Son to be the mediator. And you have to embrace this. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. Now, suppose we were in a strange town, and, and you need to go somewhere. You need to ask directions, right? 
Unless you're a man, you just go. <laughs> Try to get them, right? So, so you're straight down in these directions, and the, the person you ask says, here's how you get there. Take the first street on the right, then go to the second left, cross the square, go past the church, take the third street down, and go right, and then on the road, take the fourth left. <coughs> how many do you think you'll get Well, I suppose, I suppose, the person we ask says, come, I'll show you that. Kind of reminds me of the Amazing Race, right? You ever seen that show? People are in foreign countries, right? Ooh, I want to go here. And people go, no English, you know. It's like, oh. You know, and they got the, the maps are in foreign languages, and they're just going, ah. and then they go, we need to get to this place. And once in a while, they'll find somebody who said, I will pay They won't say it in their foreign language. You go, da, 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 da. yeah. But Jesus made the claim, I am the truth. If I said it, if my words proclaim it, it's true. You never have to question that. Isn't that important? Because there's a lot of things you don't always know is true. And if you follow things that are untrue, you're following deception. And you know what it's like to follow deception. You get burned. You get hurt. You get destroyed. You get damaged. You get, you get all kinds of complications in life when you follow things that are true. And isn't it good to know that God has provided us with truth? Inerrant, infallible, the living word of God, spoken, directed, superintended by God, the living word, two men so they could write it down so that you would never have to wonder what is true, what is right, what is the way, what is the truth, what is the life. Jesus is the truth. Truth is a person. He's the living truth. Because Jesus is truth, we can depend on what He says about salvation, about getting to heaven. What Jesus says matters. Right? Now, many people in our lives have told us the truth, but no one has ever embodied the truth. Right? And there's one important thing about moral teaching. A man's character really does not affect his teaching of geometry or, uh, uh, or astronomy, right? He can could, he could be the worst jerk in the world to his family, but he can still go teach geometry, right? He can be the most vile person in the world and go still teach astronomy, right? We probably can learn something from that. But if you aspire to teach truth, moral truth, the character of the person makes all the difference in the world. Because an adulterer who teaches the necessity of purity, a stingy person who teaches the value of generosity, a domineering person who teaches the beauty of humility, and an embittered person who teaches the beauty of love is bound to be very ineffective. We don't listen to people. Talk about moral teaching. Who are living up to it. 
Moral truth cannot be solely conveyed in words. It has to be conveyed by example. And here's where the greatest human teachers fall down. No teacher has ever embodied the truth they taught, except one, Jesus Christ. Many could have said, I taught you the truth. Jesus is the only one who could say, I am the truth. Finally, Jesus is the life. He is life in himself. He is the giver and source of for his home, for those who receive him as life. Jesus is alive because he's not subjected to death. Rather, he made death subject to him through his glorious resurrection over the grave. That's why that's so important. The Bible says all things were made by him and nothing was made, and without him, nothing was made. Christ is the source of our life. In Him we live and move and have our being. In Him all things in this world are held together. That's why He is the life. This world, the fact that we can sit in gravity in these seats, in this day on uh, May 31st, 2015, is because Christ is holding it all together. Because He's our life. The sad thing, most people never come to realize that or recognize that Christ is our life. He did not live his life as the ultimate, uh, with death as the ultimate end of his life. He died to demonstrate the power and the continuity of his life. And he came because he soundly defeated death, and because he's the resurrection and the life. He is the only one. Get life from Jesus. That's why he says, I'm the one. You are mine. You want to fill the emptiness in your soul? I'll give it to you. I'll fill it with me. And you'll be full. I'm the life. You're not going to get life from this world. You're not going to get it. Because we all know, I'll, I'll do the golf club experiment one more time, right? How many drivers do I have to have to, to satisfy me? There hasn't been one yet, right? There's always one more, and it's 400 bucks. <laughs> It's going to hit it straighter and longer, and Dumbo hasn't figured out it's not the club, it's the guy swinging the club, right? Okay? But we all think, oh, if I get this, if I have this, if I get this, that's going to satisfy me in life. Just like that car you're driving, it satisfies you maybe for a while, until you get it paid off and you want payments again, right? Well, I haven't found too many people getting life from cars. And I haven't found too many people getting life from, from drugs. And I haven't found too many people getting life from sexual experience. And I haven't found too many people. It's just a temporary filler of our time to take us till we die. And then we realize Jesus really was. So I ask you this morning that you just bow your heads. Have you personally embraced Jesus as a way to He said, I didn't say it, he said it. He is the only one. If you want to be in the place, the heavenly place, his father's house with many rooms that Jesus talked about. You want to be there in your future. If when you die, you know death is. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, right in the golf cart. Doesn't it seem like people are dying younger and younger and younger? I said, yeah. It just seems that way. More cancer, more accidents, more tragedies, more death is coming upon the society and culture at an alarming rate. And there's no escape for that into a future of eternity in the presence of God without personally acknowledging in our hearts personally that Jesus is the way. How do we do it? We tell him, Jesus, you are. I acknowledge you as the way. I accept you. I accept you as the truth. I accept you as the way. I confess my sins. I've, I've, I've offended you, God. 
I've lied. I've cheated. I've fought bad thoughts. I've said horrible things. I've been mean. I've been this, that, or the other thing. And some people think, how could Jesus, death, how could Jesus forgive me all my sins? Because His Word says He does. So will you by faith reach out and receive Him as way, truth, and life? That is the way you know your foundation for your future is secure. It's secure in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everyone can leave this auditorium this morning with the excitement, with the encouragement, with the assurance that if today is your last day, it's only your last day on earth, it will be your first day in eternity with Jesus. Father, I pray our hearts and our thoughts right now to embrace I think Jesus as well. If there's an unbeliever here today, someone who's not sure, I pray that they would come to realize Jesus for the first time by acknowledging Him as the way, the truth, and life, I think. Begin to discover how Jesus fills life, how Jesus gives life, how Jesus gives meaning and purpose to life. How Jesus can correct the past. How he can, how he can, how he can put it behind us and give us a fresh start. Father, I pray for Christians here today who have lost sight of the fact that Jesus is the way to We thank you, God, that you love us enough to bring us seed into this world of trial and darkness and difficulties. And you give us hope. Give us a Savior who is Jesus, the way that you live. I pray that he will be a powerful life to us as we live for him. Father, if I, pray, I pray today if there's someone here who is confused or who has embraced Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord for the first time. Father, I pray that you give them the courage to tell somebody about it. I pray that they have the courage to talk to me and say, yeah, Pastor, I, I embrace Jesus today. That's why you now I know my future is secure because Jesus is living. I give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.